So, uh, my name is Thomas, and I'm a graduate student at Humboldt State University. I work with the HSU River Institute under Dr. Allison O'Dowd, and I'm uh, happy to continue the conversation on flow management, in particular, attempting to provide a biological link um, with benthic macroinvertebrates as a food resource for, for salmon. So, uh, my thesis is on benthic macroinvertebrate communities and juvenile Chinook salmon diet um, on the Trinity River below the Lewiston Dam. This is a magnificent salmon fly larva, which is definitely one of the larger things we come across. So the Trinity River is a 266 kilometer long river or waterway starting um, at uh, Trinity Lake um, and then stretching from Lewiston Dam to its confluence with the Klamath River and then flowing out to the Pacific Ocean. It's historically renowned for its resource in timber um, as well as mining and uh, as a uh, cultural and food resource for uh, the form of salmon for um, Native communities, including the Yurok, Kawa, Kauru, and the uh, Upa people. So, Lewiston Dam was constructed in 1963, uh, which immediately led to the loss of approximately 109 miles of spawning habitat upstream of the dams. And it at one time diverted up to 90% of the flows annually incurred within Trinity Basin to the Central Valley for municipal and agricultural water. And the diversion of that much water led to the channelization of um, the river downstream of the dam, which is when uh, the uh, alluvial floodplains are lost due to, due to vegetation encroachment close to the water's edge. In the 1980s, a flow evaluation study was conducted by the Hoopa Fisheries Program, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife was ultimately found um, that insufficient flows were the number one limiting factor for salmon populations downstream of uh, Lewiston Dam. And that led to the signing and implementation of the Record of Decisions, signed in 2000, which attempts to exhibit pre-dam conditions through a variety of, of actions, including flow allocation, as well as site-specific habitat restoration, like uh, gravel injections and uh, channel reconstruction, which is pretty, pretty prevalent in the Trinity Rivers. So our focus period uh, was in 2018, uh, where we were actually able to take what is a normal rod flow and kind of reconstruct it into two, exper uh, two experimental pulses immediately prior to the rod flow, where the majority of our study focuses at the, at the base flow conditions, um, but we were able to uh, study invertebrate drift concentrations and juvenile diet during those two experimental peaks. And originally, we would have liked to study more peaks to kind of try to exhibit um, a more natural hydrograph. However, the flow work group, um, out of, amongst other concerns, but out of fear of being sued by the Central Valley, um, we ultimately landed on the two peak scenario. But we, uh, the, the, the projection of this research is to ultimately study how um, a natural hydrograph affects benthic microbiome drift. Uh, juvenile diet. Our research objectives include describing invertebrate species composition, abundance, and biomass in both the drift and the benthos of the Trinity River, which has largely been um, under-evaluated on the Trinity River as there's been a whole lot of emphasis on physical habitat restoration for juveniles, but not so much on the productivity level for as a source of food. And we also wanted to describe juvenile salmon diet. We wanted to compare um, these communities daily and seasonally uh, between February and April of 2018 within the drift, benthos, and diet, as well as between flow conditions, so between those base flows as well as um, those two experimental uh, events or peak discharges. And ultimately, this data would inform future research on experimental flows that attempt to kind of shift the rock flows earlier in the season to try to form a more natural hydrograph and it would inform flow management on the Trinity River below Lewiston and ultimately um, support hypotheses uh, by the Trinity River Restoration Program that flow and uh, increase food availability for juveniles and thus increase rearing capacities in, uh, in physical habitat. So we studied, we, we chose two study sites uh, downstream of Lewiston Dam our upstream site sawmill, 
and downstream site Steel Bridge. And it should be noted that Steel Bridge has tributary influence by uh, Brush Creek Watershed as well as Grass Alley Creek Watersheds. Sawmill is approximately five kilometers downstream of Lewiston with no tributary influence, meaning what's released from Lewiston Dam is largely what's observed at our upstream site. And this is a digital elevation model just to emphasize the fact that sawmill is a bit more complex in, in habitat or um, uh, in, in refugia for juveniles under, under peak discharge events. So, so during those experimental pulses, juveniles may have uh, a larger range of habitat in the form of wetted off channels or just these sidebars that they can seek refuge um, during increased velocities of our experimental pulses. Whereas our downstream site, Steel Bridge, is a prime example of that channelization impact where the vegetation in the form of alder and willow come right up to the channel. Um, it's approximately 21 kilometers downstream, and like I mentioned earlier, it's uh, influenced by both Rush Creek and Grass Valley Creek water tributaries. Our sampling schedule consisted of 28 days of sampling between February and April of 2018. Anything in red here is when we were out sampling. Um, so as you see, most of our data is in the form of base flow conditions or steady state flow releases out of Lewiston. But we were able to study um, one day prior to the experimental pulse as well as the peak discharge events of both pulses and, uh, and two days after. And just for some perspective, this is our upstream site sawmill exhibiting base flow conditions, and this is what it looks like just for the majority of our data. This is one day after, so during the peak discharge of one of our experimental pulses, it's roughly a four to five fold increase in discharge, and you can see just the, the uh, increase in wetted area during these flows. Uh, two days after the initiation of our experimental pulse, and three days after at 900 CFS. Our field methods included um, uh, snorkel seining for juvenile Chinook. Uh, this is a successful seining. Not all the seinings looked like this, uh, especially during our, our peak discharge events. It was, it was extraordinarily hard to usually just find juveniles in, in that amount of water, plus you're dealing with velocities. So we were out there for quite a while sometimes um, fishing for juveniles. And of which we, uh, we have approximately 580 diet samples that were extracted via gastric lavage. And then for our benthic invertebrate sampling, we use server nets, of which we have uh, 18 for both sites. And we use drift nets to account for, or to, to capture invertebrate drift concentrations, um, of which we have 168. Anytime we captured drift, we were also taking velocity measurements, um, DO, and temperature in front of each net. Throughout, the, uh, throughout our time of sampling. And we, we, our, our drift nets were set out for two hours each day around uh, sunset, just to kind of uh, standardize our sampling procedure. Our lab methods included taking our invertebrates down to a family order for aquatic insects, and then class or order for aquatic non-insects, like freshwater crustaceans, or uh, terrestrial resource insects that may have fallen into the uh, water column. And then we use basic length math regressions and the uh, published constants to assess their biomass. So you just get a length of each individual, pump them through a bunch of regressions, and you get an approximation of how much mass there is. That way we don't have to incinerate all the bugs that we've spent hours and hours and hours counting. Um, of which we counted about over 100,000 invertebrates, which is like a huge sample size. We, we, uh, We've had a lot of undergraduate help and RE research um, help throughout the, our, our time in the lab. And I wish this were the kind of talk where I could just show you pictures of our bugs um, and talk about how cool they are, but sadly it's not. I have to get my results. So I'll be, I'll be using this little graphic just to kind of navigate my way through what our, our findings where our upstream site sawmill is. Um, Influenced only by Lewiston Dam, whereas our downstream site has two tributary influences. Keeping in mind that our upstream site is a bit more complex in habitat and refugia for juveniles, meaning they may have um, a, a place to hide and pick a feeding station during increased discharge events, whereas our downstream site um, competition may be more of an impact, there may be less habitat available. 
and I'll only be focusing on abundance data today, just for the sake of time. Um, and I'll be using hydrographs with uh, abundance data superimposed on top of it, as well as NMDS uh, coordination using breaker to the similarities. So, at our upstream site sawmill, uh, we, we really observed a variable response in our drift concentrations. Under, our, our, our original hypotheses were that increased discharge events would increase invertebrate drift concentrations, but that really um, showed variable responses in, at both pulses, and we actually had a decreased uh, drift concentration observed during our first initial pulse. However, all of the data kind of falls within this, this large band of variability, and I'm, I'm unconfident in making any solid conclusions as to the impact of those peak discharge events at sawmill just because the data was generally pretty variable. Um, however, at sawmill, the, the taxa composition was largely dominated by both beta day and mayfly midge larvae. Um, the, the larger dominant taxa being, um, being uh, mayfly, or sorry, chromid midge. And even though we didn't uh, observe like uh, increases in, in drift concentrations or number of invertebrates per volume of flow, we did see a pretty significant taxonomic shift during our peak discharge events, where uh, at both pulses we saw pretty significant increases uh, in chromid as well as daphnia or water flea larvae or uh, water fleas during both experimental pulses um, and kind of decreased compositions of, uh, of other tax equity in those day-to-day. -day. Whereas our downstream site saw a pretty significant seasonal decrease in invertebrate drift concentrations through time. Um, and during our first experimental pulse, uh, we saw a significant increase in, in drift concentrations that was not captured during our second experimental pulse. And in general, the taxa composition at our downstream site was larger, more diverse, and specialized taxa, including um, uh, caddisflies like Glossosoma or predatory stoneflies, as well as beta and chromid were, were present as well, but to a lesser degree. And during our experimental pulse, it was pretty much only uh, chromid, uh, midge, larva, as well as those, those daphnia that may be coming from the reservoir or from wetted marginal areas. Um, and if you, if you don't account for chronomids in this kind of trend, um, there's really no increase, significant increase in, in beta day or, or predatory or other specialized taxa. The, that this significant increase is solely due to a large pulse of chronomids, probably coming from upstream sources and marginal wetted areas that are being flushed downstream. And the same effect was not captured during our second pulse meaning those marginal areas, uh, the algae and stuff uh, built up during that long period of base flow had been flushed downstream already. So how does that relate to our juvenile diet? So at our upstream site, we saw pretty similar to what we captured in our drift concentrations, where numbers of invertebrates per juvenile diet kind of varied across, the sales, uh, across our sampling period peaking in March, um, and again, we didn't see increased numbers of invertebrates in, in juvenile diet during our, uh, our pulse release, although it, 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 it kind of ticked up a little bit, but again, it falls within a normal um, bar of variability, so I'm, I'm again, kind of unconfident in, in making any hard line conclusions with that. But, Similar to our drift concentrations, during base flow conditions, we kind of saw most of the, of the fish were eating beta day or, or, or midge um, larva, and then during our peak discharge events, the diet largely um, reflected that of the drift, where they were pretty much only eating chronic midge uh, larva. And our downstream site saw suppressed numbers of invertebrates throughout the entire sampling period. But again, it, it represented that of the drift concentration. Uh, so even though they were eating less individuals, the, the individuals themselves were larger. So uh, Glossosoma and predatory stoneflies can easily wait to like hundreds of, 
of little crimes. So that should be taken into account. And there was no taxonomic shift during our peak district events similar to uh, at our upstream site saw. Now I'm going to move on to ordination, which is kind of notoriously hard to, to interpret sometimes. But in general, the relative distances between points represent similarities or dissimilarities. And in this case, um, I'm cautious with interpreting the, net, the overlaps between our communities, but rather the, um, the trends between communities and discharge. So in this case, our green polygon represents diet. It's highly variable. It overlaps with both the drift and benthic communities, uh, of which the red polygon represents our benthic community, and the blue polygon represents our, our drift communities. And the size of each individual point represents the um, discharge at which it was it was sampled there. So peak discharges versus base flows. And as you see at our upstream site, uh, as I said earlier, we saw those, sh those strong shifts in, in taxonomic composition in all three of the communities. So in the benthic community, in the drift community, and in our diets, um, there was a strong shift towards coronamid larvae during the, those peak discharge events. Whereas our base flow conditions largely exhibited uh, Day to day, as well as other EPT taxa. And chronomids alone uh, explained as much as 37% of variability when uh, fitting in an environmental vector to our coordination data. Whereas our downstream site, uh, even we saw those shifts, those taxonomic shifts in our drift and benthic data. However, the fish themselves did not exhibit the same taxonomic shifts as our, our as the drift and the benthos, suggesting that they were uh, not necessarily given the same chance to to capitalize on the changes in the food availability or the food resources to them at our downstream site, like they were at our upstream site. Saw them. Where our chronomid and beta day were still significant taxa, however, chronomids explained less of the variability and it was more uh, evenly distributed between our other other taxa sampled, like beta day and EPT taxa. So, some discussion points: our upstream site sawmill um, heat flow suppression largely uh, uh, determined uh, what what what, the, what taxa we saw during during our experimental pulses, where stay state discharge was observed until the first pulse release. And I believe that that led to a, the generalist invertebrate tax or the chronomids to, um, to kind of grow in, in abundance during that period of time where, um, where they're, they're growing and, and taking advantage of that increased wetted area um, that, of that more complex habitat at our upstream site. And during that first peak pulse, there was a strong taxonomic shift, kind of flushing all of those coronavids downstream. Whereas our downstream site is more seasonally driven, uh, there were decreases in invertebrate abundances over time. However, during the first experimental pulse, there were large increases in both coronavid and, and uh, daphnia. During the first pulse release, however, during the second pulse release, we did not observe the same impact. And uh, invertebrate abundance in diet did not increase in conjunction with our drift concentrations. And this all may have some management implications where peak flow suppression may drive increases in invertebrate drift following a pulse. However, that may be limited as, um, as more pulses are, are used uh, after the first pulse. Uh, channelization may impact a juvenile's ability to access that increased food availability as, as we observed at our downstream site sawmill. Um, and if you're a manager, you may want to account for those longitudinal taxonomic differences uh, when, you're, when you're considering in, trying to increase food concentrations for, for juvenile and increase your capacity. So, with that, thanks for listening, and I'll uh, be happy to take any questions. So it's again a two-part question. Um, <laughs> I can have it. Oh, wait. Uh, so traditional way of thinking that drift is a sort of avoidance mechanism or a recolonization mechanism. So that's why they are drifting more during the dark period or at dusk time that where you, your drift was sampled. 
And then also, but your, your fish was sampled, I assume, during daytime? Our, our fish were sampled in conjunction with our drift. So we set At the same time. We, we set drift nets and then uh, for the, that two hour period, we then sampled. So yeah. were they actually actively consuming? But that's one question. I was, and then another thing would be uh, for your drip sample, you presented as a, a concentration of the bugs, but how about the overall the quality accumulating with the uh, time ties to the, your uh, flow at the time, uh, over the time? Yeah. Well, I'll address the first question. So, um, yeah, we, we, our, our drip nets were, you know, set two hours prior to sunset, whereas a lot of drift studies set them two hours after, and um, you know, and that diel cycle uh, can can increase in vertebrate drift concentrations, or the, that strong, or that quick change in, in light intensity. However, we, we try to set it two hours prior to kind of avoid behavioral drift more and, and sample more during a period um, where Experimental pulses may may actively uh, increase drift concentrations by entraining them in the water column. And as far as the second question, um, if the juveniles were actively feeding during our sampling period, I, I, I believe so. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> just had a question about um, if, if you had been able to look at um, equivalent discharges and the relationship between discharge and your, your drift concentrations like on the ascending limb of one of the pulses and at the same discharge on the descending limb and what kind of you saw there. Yeah, so we would have liked to sample the, um, the, the actual discharge events closer at a finer level. However, uh, our, our discharge data is almost on a more categorical level where, where we sample one day prior to peak discharge at base flow, and then the immediate next day we sampled was already at peak discharge. So I can't, can't really make any solid conclusions about the ascending one. However, this next round of research um, that will be conducted with the drift concentration on the Trinity will focus specifically on that ascending limb to account for any kind of uh, uh, hysteresis effect with drift concentrations, which they can skyrocket in, in concentrations during that ascending and kind of gradually decrease descending. We'll plan on taking that into account. So you mentioned about the two tributaries coming in, but they didn't seem to affect your hydrograph much in the, the pre-experimental flow. Have you thought about going a little further down on the Trinity, like below the North Fork, where you actually could get your, your natural variation in the hydrograph from the winter events to have more of, a, of another comparison to what the communities could look like or the variations? Yeah. Yeah. So. So our, our hydrograph, um, we, we, we actually didn't observe any kind of natural storms um, prior to our experimental discharge at our, at our downstream site. Um, however, looking at like historical data, that downstream site does does exhibit uh, like those tributaries do influence um, the hydrograph a bit. It's just we were unfortunately unable to, to capture um, that kind of effect. But again, getting back to our next round of research um, that we're considering upping upping our, our sites to rather than just two to four sites and farther downstream to to yeah to account for stronger tributary influences and more what may look like a more natural hydrogen. 